from this evening is one that features senior members of Washington who will discuss their experiences of growing up in this community some 80 or 70 to 85 years ago. This is recorded on Monday, January 27, 2003, and sponsored by the Washington Historical Society. They're all primed and ready. They have their stories all ready, I'll tell you. First of all, we're going to have the uh, Girl Scouts come and uh, lead us in the pledge. So if you would all stand, please. <laughs>
Obviously, he still lives at home. Uh, we lived in Washington State uh, after uh, our wedding and lived there until we built a house in Firethorn, and that's currently where we reside today. Uh, as I look back, uh, just a few quick stories of growing up in Sunnyland. Uh, I used to ride my bicycle to uh, what we call Ghoul's Variety Store, uh, Reed's Market, Mack High, and Thompson's to buy baseball cards. Uh, back then, uh, we didn't have the money yet, had the paper out to. Uh, seems like today you hand kids money all the time. You always got their hand out, and it's not a dollar anymore, it's five or ten dollars. But uh, we attended District 50 uh, grade school, where I probably played for one of the best uh, coaches that I could have played for, and that's Mr. Holford. I think Mr. Holford's here tonight. Uh, I, I actually look older than Mr. Holford, but uh, <laughs> I, did, I did play for Mr. Holford. Uh, it was funny, growing up without a gymnasium, uh, Sunnyland didn't have a gymnasium until. 1972 or three, uh, we'd have to shovel the snow to practice. And uh, when Mr. Goldberg became our coach at 8th grade, he actually got pretty good in at the high school, and we got what we called the girl gym back then, which uh, now is obviously the West Gym, to be politically correct. Went on to Washington High School to also growing up in, in a Christian church. I uh, was on a member of the dartball team. I don't know if any of you here played church dartball. We played the city building on the square. And probably seven or eight games going on at once. And it wasn't a quiet sport by any means for a bunch of Christians to get together and yell and scream at somebody trying to hit a small spot on a dartboard. But that was an enjoyable time also. Washington High School, I played basketball and baseball. I was lucky to be a member of one of the uh, best teams in WCHS in 71-72. We lost the manual in the sectional championship. And at that time, I began, I began to understand how special this community was. Uh, the 7,300 people at the field house on that Friday night, I can guarantee over 5,000 was from Washington. We came back on the bus after that loss. We could turn around and you could see cars that looked like the field of dreams. All the cars coming back into town and they all showed up at the gym. And it reminded me almost of the 1962 team with uh, the Kelpies and the and Greshams and uh, Dirth and Mern and, and uh, Kelly, I believe, and one of the others. When we watched them come back from Champaign, <coughs> run, run, all the way to Eureka, I believe. Uh, and I was eight years old at that time. Uh, but always great community support. It's just been unbelievable. Uh, I remember after practices, we'd head to uh, either Rexall's or Don's Pharmacy to get a vanilla Coke. Uh, always a special time. Went to work uh, late in my senior year for John Foster, out of the Foster family farm, uh, trying to run a tractor. I hope you don't ask John if that was good or bad, but uh, I'm a horrible. Uh, Mr. Foster was still alive at that time, and I think he was trying to find something else for me to do. But, uh, after that, I went to uh, work at Clink's, Bob Clink's Hardware. Uh, at that time, he was closing the Eureka store, and uh, special time, just how uh, Bob was. We uh, were tearing that store down, I stepped on a nail. And, uh, you know, Bob doesn't send you home. He takes you to a small doctor's office in Eureka, gets a tetanus shot, and brought you back to work. <laughs> you know, I didn't think anything about it. It didn't hurt that bad. But uh, after that, I went to work at Convenient Food Mart for Larry Stone. Worked there uh, while I attended ICC. From there, I went to uh, Caterpillar, and I've been there for 29 years in March uh, in truck engine marketing, and I'm enjoying it. And, I'm, I'm really almost ashamed to be here with, with uh, the stories that are going to be told. Uh, but thank you for inviting me, and enjoy the evening. Well, I'm going to start my story a little bit ahead of me being born. Uh, there's a few people probably in this room that remembers when the Washington City Building, where Breckland's is now, was a hotel. My grandfather, Sam Puckett, owned that hotel. And my mother used to tell stories about being raised in the upstairs and watching out the window and seeing all the things happening around the square back in those days. So that's the start of my story. And uh, now we're going to get to me. I was born in Eureka, lived there till the age of five, moved to Peoria and lived in Peoria all the way through grade school till seventh grade, and then moved back to Washington in 1947 
and I've been here ever since. In uh, 1956, I married Norma Van Syak, my wife who's here, and from that marriage we had four sons. Kurt lives in Washington now, Craig lives in Bend, Oregon, they were twins, and Doug lives in Knoxville, Tennessee, and Eric lives in Leesburg, Virginia. And we have four grandchildren, so my wife and I do quite a bit of travel. Uh, my first job in Washington, I worked in the old Paul's Market in the meat department for Pat Hennessy at the time. And uh, that's where Parrish's Pub is now, it used to be Paul's Market. And then Pat went out of the meat business and Paul, Paul bought the meat department out. And when I was a sophomore in high school, I went to work for Mel Finley on the south side of the square. Uh, I worked there all the way through high school. And when I graduated from high school, I went over to Caterpillar and signed up for an apprentice course, but I had to wait to get in. And uh, I waited. While I was waiting, I worked for Don Banghart as a mason contractor with him. And I worked down at Comet Oil for Elmer Portscheller and Ed Schaubinger. And there's a little story about the working down at the Comet. When I was hired, Elmer was talking to me, and he said, now on Friday night, people come in and cash their checks and pay their gas bill. So he said, there's a drawer over in that desk, and he showed me the drawer. And he said, on Friday, there'll be a lot of money in there, and there'll be a German Luger pistol in there, and it's loaded. <laughs> and if anybody tries to get the money, that pistol's to protect you. And I said, if you think for one minute that I'm going to risk my life saving your money, I'm never going to touch that pistol. <laughs> and I never did touch that pistol. <laughs> then uh, I finally got hired in 54 into the Caterpillar Apprentice course. And uh, I always tell people I was dumber than the average bear because it took six years to get through a four-year apprentice course. <laughs> but that was due to layoffs and cutbacks and that kind of thing. Now, every time that I got laid off, I, it was a good deal because I bought double my wages. I could get a job cutting meat somewhere. <laughs> because when I started in the apprentice course, I was working for 89 cents an hour. <laughs> Uh, I went back to Caterpillar every time they called me back, and I stayed there until the age of 57 and retired, and I had 40 years of service. All my time was spent in maintenance as a pipe fitter and as a maintenance supervisor. Uh, two claims to fame that my wife said that I should mention at this time are I have been running the down box at the Washington football games for 50 years now. <laughs> and I've been on the Washington Planning Commission for 25 years. I feel like I'm in the new kid on the block here. <laughs> I hardly know where to start with one other kid in the school. As a little girl, she's a little slow, hard to learn. But they wouldn't have everybody have a little part. So she got up and she started. I stepped this side, went this side. I am so afraid I shall forget my part. So I am going to quit before I start. I was born in Southern Illinois in Hamilton County, one of the poorest counties in the state. Now they tell me. Might be poor now since I left. But, uh, I'm married to my wife there. And Hamilton County, be 68 years in May, and she's here tonight. So anyway, I was born with eight boys and three girls in the family. Discipline, we knew what discipline was because they all paddle right behind the door or a razor strap if we got out of line. I came to Peoria, I didn't come to Peoria first, I came to um, around Gold Point and the uh, Western area. I shucked corn that time, my first time up there for a cent and a half a bushel. If you can imagine that, I made maybe a dollar a day. Then I finally got on an ABC wash machine plant in 1935, started there, got laid off in 38, went on the farm for about two years. Then I went back to the factory at Laterna, over to Laterna about a year, and about that time the war started. I went over to Caterpillar. 
and uh, 1940, about the start of the war, uh, I started in 1942. But anyway, I moved to Washington in 1943, Washington area. Moved down to Liberty Lane, and uh, at that time it was a dirt road, mud road, and uh, we had to drag our own road, and right during the war, the, uh, we tried to get them gravel. So we can't do any gravel and we don't have the money. But if you don't pay for half the gravel, for the first half a mile, we'll grab it. So my brother and I would pay for the first half a mile of gravel, half the first half a mile. In 1944, I built a little house on Liberty Lane. And uh, I first bought the, moved the house, I rented it. And then I bought the house, I rented it, and moved it. Chris Ebert, he was in the house moving business. I asked him <coughs> if he'd move the house for me. Well, he says the boys are, that was Ray and Fox up in, in Minnesota fishing. And if I would not, when they got back, they'd move it. Well, I started laying the block and got the blocks all laid up, and they hadn't got it back yet. And it was getting right in the fall, and I asked Chris, if you bring the timbers out, will you let me move it? He says, what do you know about moving a house? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, well, but if you'll uh, let me use the timber, my brother and I will move it. All right, but you can use the timber, but don't hold me responsible for it. <laughs> right. We jacked the house up. It's a good 20, 24 house. The night we had it ready to move. We pulled it over the basement, and I lived there for about 60 years. I just moved to town in June. I feel like I'm a country boy. just don't know what to do with myself. They say you can take the boy out of the country, but take the country out of the way. After working at Caterpillar uh, for, I uh, worked there for 36 years, retired in 1977. I have plenty to do out there on the farm. I moved to town in, uh, 19, in this year of June, the last year of June. I keep myself pretty busy out there until it got cold and I had, had to hold up in the winter like the groundhog. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I have two children, a girl and a boy. The girl is 63, the boy is 57, and uh, the girl in Delaware, she taught school for 32 years, and she retired about a year ago. The boy, he drives a truck for the distributing company here in URF. He taught school for 12 years and didn't like teaching, so he moved it, went driving a truck. I still remember when he was a little bit of kid, he always went driving a truck in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we finally got what he liked to do. And, uh, I have uh, one of the salt bills. That's not the huge version. I'm to be here. Joyce, I'm not talking about Joyce. Joyce and Dad was my first foreman at Caterpillar. And we hit it off real well. So I moved out here while he gave me a petition to join the Masonic Lodge. I joined the Masonic Lodge in 1946 and I was still a lifetime member. So uh, it was through Morris Craig while well, I, I got acquainted with a lot of people here. And thanks to you, Joyce. Really here tonight. I was born in 1924, in the month of February, in Peoria, however, but my folks live in Washington, at 108 East Jefferson, where Merle Evans lives today. We lived there about a year, a little over a year, and they decided to build a new house up on Church Street. And the reason they wanted to move was at that time, even before that time, there was talk going on about running Route 24 straight through Peoria, or through Washington to avoid the square. And they felt that uh, that was going to be a highway they didn't want to be on. <laughs> <laughs> so we moved uh, up on Church Street. I, we lived there until, well, 1946. And uh, I went through all the grades in Washington. Uh, was fortunate enough to have Miss Mary in the first grade, which uh, I really enjoyed. And I spent my freshman year here, and then we moved to Metamora, and I spent my sophomore and junior years up there in high school, and then came back here for my senior year. So I ended up graduating with the, most of the kids that I started out with in first grade. Uh, in 1942, that was the class I was in, of course, war 
was on at that time. And this was the last class to graduate in the old high school. The next, the next year, the new class graduated out in the new, new school. Uh, I spent a little over two years in the Navy. When I came home, uh, I married Ethel Hartman. We had two children. My son Jim lives at Sparland. My daughter Jean lives out on Shook Road. And after that, we ran a hardware store for 25 years here in town. Enjoyed it always. Uh, Ethel passed away in 1983. And in 1986, I married Helen Gillespie. And she's here today. But uh, we've, we've enjoyed Washington. We've had a lot of fun here. It's been a great time to live in. That's about it for me. Well, uh, I first want to start by saying I have the privilege of um, visiting people in our congregation. I belong to the Lutheran Church here in town, and I'm employed as a parish nurse there, so I do a lot of hospital and homebound visits. Uh, Marguerite Lucas is a member of our congregation, and it just so happened last Thursday I stopped at her new home at Rosewood. And I thought she was going to be here tonight, and she said she didn't think she could make it. So she said, would you give them my regards? She's such an interesting person to talk to. I hate it that she's not here because um, she talks to me every time I go there about things that used to happen that I remember when I was a little girl. And she said she wanted to remind you all that when she came to town in 1939, the edge of town was right there where Uncle Billy Hess's house is, you know where the Hardee's is? That was the edge of town and that there was a sign that said population 1900. That was in 1939. And uh, she said her family, she and Guy Lucas, he was an engineer for the railroad, the TPNW. In fact, um, his son, um, Gary. Gary, and he has a son, Don, um, that are still around here. Um, they built a house in the 800 block of Jefferson Street that's still standing. I think it's still blue today, isn't it? Painted blue? I'm not sure, but it was across the street from where I live. Right, right. <laughs> and she said that to build that house, they had to use uh, clam shovels because this was in 1939. They dug the basements with uh, horses wagons and these clam shovels. And I'm not even sure I know what a clam shovel is, but she was telling me that's what they did. And she said at that time they built this seven room house and they thought they were in heaven because they had all these kids and all these bedrooms and she just thought that was a great house. She also said to tell you that she remembers um, the fact that they didn't, I, I laughed at this one, you didn't have a private telephone line. So, <laughs> coming from Marguerite, this is funny because she likes to laugh. And she said, there'd be 13 or 14 people on that line. And every time you picked up that telephone, you'd have to tell somebody to get off so you could call. <laughs> but the funny part is, as a young child, I remember picking up the telephone also. And um, the operator would say, number please. Yeah. And then you would give the number. And sometimes the operator would be your friend. And you, so you'd chit-chat with your friend a little bit before you got the number you were Or you'd say, I want to talk to so-and-so, and she'd say, well, they're gone. Marguerite also said that she remembers Mr. Ortwine, who was the butcher where Finley's Meat Market is, and they always, he always saw that her family had meat, even during the wartime. And we were talking about rations, and um, she said, they would take their rations up to the meat market and they always save some meat for her family and he probably did that for a lot of people here in town. The other thing she told me about was she remembers very distinctly, and I'll bet a lot of you do this too, 1941 Pearl Harbor. She said she was listening to the radio. She knew where Pearl Harbor was, she said, but she said a lot of people weren't even sure where Pearl Harbor was, but they had heard that we had been bombed at Pearl Harbor and what a shocking time that was. And the only other thing we talked about that day, I could have spent hours with her, but 
my time was short, she said that building came fast in Washington, and it must have, because she was talking about 1,900 people in 1939. I was born, I don't usually admit this, but you people all know this, <laughs> I'm 60, <laughs> it's a hard age to be, and I was born in 1942. And I remember growing up here in town, um, the population being around 4,000 when I was a young child. But I, my mother, you probably all knew my mother better than you know me. My mother was Arlene Ward, and Arlene saved everything. This is the original bill for my birth. Dr. Rich, I cost $50. Lillian Rich, obstetrical fee paid in full, $50, 1942. Uh, she also saved, and you won't believe this, I didn't take it out of the scrapbook. You know that little piece of tape they put in your belly? Yeah. Your yeah. My mother saved it. <laughs> I had it in my book tonight, but I didn't bring it. <laughs> it had my name, a you know, baby ward, and it gave my birth date and the weight, that kind of stuff. Uh, my family came to Washington in the late 20s. My grandfather came from Switzerland as an immigrant through Ellis Island, settled in Pennsylvania. From Pennsylvania, he went to Ohio, and all his brothers and sisters still, well, there's only one left, but live in Ohio, or they lived in Ohio, and they were dairy farmers. My grandfather came to Washington, Illinois from Ohio and brought my mother and her two sisters. My grandfather's name was Felix Witchy. So if you're older, you probably remember Felix. And I can remember going around town and people called my mother and her two sisters, they called them the witchy girls. <laughs> and they used to call me the one, well, you're one of the witchy girls. <laughs> and I, when I took the job for our church three years ago, visiting the nursing home, I, one of the ladies, and she's now deceased, was Millie Brooker from here in Washington. Her husband used to work for my grandfather in construction because he, I believe he was an electrician, wasn't he? Or was he a plumber? Electrician, okay. Millie, bless her heart, before she passed away was having problems um, and could not remember things. I walked into that nursing home and she said to me, you're one of the witchy girls. <laughs> so you can't get away from that. But my grandfather uh, settled here in town, and he first bought and sold gold, and that was during the Depression time. And he didn't even have a car, and he would hitchhike from town to town, and he would buy gold in one place and sell it someplace else. Then he went to work for Caterpillar, worked there for a short time, and then started into construction. And so I brought some visual aids tonight. How many of you remember this? <laughs> this is his little apron that he wore, and my mother saved it. <laughs> so one of the other things that I found, I, I collect a lot of advertisement, and this, somebody mentioned the Eberts. Well, this is Ebert, and it's not Bob's dad. It's George Ebert, but it is a relative of Bob's, correct? This was George Ebert, Plumbing and Heating, 19 go. My mother would give me 25 cents to go to the movie on Saturday, the matinee, and it was 14 cents for the movie. Then you go to Johnny Leonard's with 11 cents, and I could get a Green River or a Vanilla Coke, and I could get one of his donuts. And everybody, and I do not know if this story is true, but they used to tell us he learned his trade in prison. So we just thought that was the greatest story. I mean, it's probably not even true. But as a kid, we thought that was the greatest story. He's a good baker. Um, the only other things I can tell you about is our fall festival. We always had that once a year in September over the Labor Day holiday. They'd block off the entire square, and so trucks and everything would have to be rerouted. And we would... Um, They'd have a carnival with rides, and the American Legion would have their barbecue or whatever they serve. They'd have a big tent up there, and that it lasted three days. It would start on a Friday, and it would last through Sunday, and that was the most fun. You know, you could your mother would turn you loose, and you could go up there and walk around there and spend every penny you had and just really have a good time. 
The other good time I can remember is on the square when we have our fountain. It used to be um, this bandstand. It was a brick bandstand. And every Wednesday night when the weather was nice, we would go up on the square and the band would play. And I, was Henry Esser, was that who the band director was? Yes. I thought that. He was the band director and people <coughs> would sit around there. They'd back their little cars into the, um, all the parking spots around there. And then they'd play their songs, and when the song was over, they'd honk their horns. <laughs> it was just a fun time that we'd run loose up there. It was a safe place to be. Some people would bring their cars up early so they'd have a good place. That's right. So they had a good place. <laughs> and to first something as a teenager, uh, one council night was when you kind of dressed up, and you and your girlfriends walked round and round the square, right. hoping that some young swain <laughs> was walking <laughs> That's absolutely, that happened in my day too. <laughs> we did the same thing. We were just probably dressed a little differently. <laughs> um, our experiences in Washington, like I said, my grandchildren are the fifth generation living here. I can't imagine living anyplace else in this world than Washington. Most of you people sitting out here I know. It shocked me the night when I walked in here. I almost could name everybody's name, some connection. Uh, or other with this town. It's just a wonderful little community to live in and raise your children in. And I'm happy. I live in Washington. I wouldn't want to live anyplace else. Can I say something else? Yes. That telephone company. Oh, yes. <laughs> in, uh, during the wartime, I worked at the telephone company. And it is true, they would call up, and you had four or five little buttons in front of you, and you'd get the number, and then you'd punch it. But you could also turn back the key and listen to the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> How do you speak? I learned a lot of stuff. <laughs> remember correctly, you went up some steps, didn't it? With have no church, I believe. Right, yeah. right. Well, that was our church originally. Yeah. Wasn't that the German Lutheran yeah. church yes. that eventually became St. Mark's Lutheran? Yes. They uh, kind of split off because the German Lutheran church spoke only German. And Bill would know this because his grandparents were, they were charter members yeah. right. of our church. Well, one other thing. Uh, I didn't move to Washington until 1938, and I was the I had spent all my school years in Peoria, and I was totally convinced that uh, I, I entered high school in my senior year, and I was, I said loudly at the table one time, there's not a soul in this town I would walk across the street with. It was kind of like me and the Sunny Land Boys. <laughs> Well, anyhow, it's a good town to live in, and I, I was going to say one thing that Marguerite told me, and it slipped my mind because I see Bob Hett sitting out there. Bob Hett's dad, Willis, built her house. I know. He's the one that was digging it with the clam shovel, and she just, in the course of the conversation that she was telling me all this stuff. Slip scoop. What was it? Slip scoop. Is that what you call it? She called it a clam shovel, and I, I don't even know what that is, but she said, Willis Hett's the one that built that house. So between yes. Willis Hett and my yes. grandpa Witchy, they must have built a lot of houses here in town. So, but thank you very much for um, inviting me tonight.
So I came back and we resolved not to live in Washington, we had uh, in Peoria, but we would move to a small town. And we had driven through Washington at one time, just driven through it, and we thought, now we'll just see what Washington is like. So when we came back, we, did, we came over and looked it over, and uh, we decided, yes, we would like to live in Washington. Well, we didn't have any decisions to make. There was one house to rent, just one. And we, so we thought, well, we'll take that. So then we called uh, the lady who owned it. And of course, during the Depression, our very first question was, how much, how much is the rent uh, for a month? She said, $10. We said, we'll take it. We didn't even look at the house. We just said, we'll take it. And we moved in at the, uh, over by the school commons at the southeast corner of the school commons. And uh, our two children, our older, Carol is the older son, started a school to Miss Mary. Uh, while we lived at this particular place, we had an interesting event uh, which took place. We had a neighbor who knocked at the door one day and uh, she said, you know, for, I'm terribly worried, our, my three-year-old little girl is missing. We can't find her. Uh, and she said, you, have you seen her? Well, of course, I said, no, I haven't seen her. She said, would you mind looking in your house? And I said, well, yes, I'll look. And I looked through my house. And nobody there but my own two children. So they looked a while, and then all the neighbors were alarmed. And finally, they, she came back, and she knocked at the door. And she said, would you look again? She must be in your house. Now, this was shortly after the Lindbergh child was abducted. And everybody had that on their mind. So we all were alarmed at that time. And uh, so I looked the second time in my house. And uh, behind the pantry door was this little three-year-old girl with her hands over her mouth to keep from laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and would you like to know who it was? Yeah. Our esteemed president of the Historical Society. <laughs> to get their books early on uh, Labor Day. Uh, Mr. Steinle handled the school's books. And two things happened each year, one, either one or the other. It either rained or they oiled the streets. <laughs> <laughs> if they oiled the streets, you can imagine what it was. We only had about three paved streets at that time. And they oiled all the streets. And uh, it was always the first day of school. And uh, it, the oil was everywhere. It was in our homes. It was on the sidewalk. It was on the roller skates. It was on in the bicycle, on the bicycles. I mean, it was in the schoolroom, and it was just terrible. But we still thought it was wonderful to have the, the oil, streets oil because you can imagine how muddy they got in the spring and fall, and it froze up, of course, a little bit in the winter and dusty all summer. And for years, I couldn't understand why they waited until the first of September to oil the streets. Well, finally, I found out after I was on the grade school board, or the library board for 23 years, I found out that that's when you got the money to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I went into this house, uh, this house only about a year and a half, and they bought a little house down the south part of town. And uh, Dick uh, Scott enters into that because. He used to uh, coast behind the house on a hill not too far away. And in the wintertime, they come to my basement where there was a little cook stove and dry their mittens. He and I older children, two children, and one was a little younger than Dick. But he remembers that, and the one on my left remembers too. Some of those <laughs> <laughs> he was in the same class as my older son. 
Well, anyway, then we decided we would build a new house. And uh, we said we had one spot picked out. If we could just build there, that would be, that was just the only thing we wanted right then. It was this little house, a little plot of ground on the north main street, a little triangular piece of ground that had never been for sale before. It belonged to the Rand family. And Uncle Philly Hess came along about that time, and he was urging us to build a new house. And I said, thinking, of course, it would never happen. I said, well, there's only one place we want to build a house. It's on that property on the north uh, edge of town, that little triangular piece of property with all those big trees. Well, by nightfall, we had the, we had the property built, uh, bought. And I've always said there was no reason why everybody in the world couldn't have a hook over their head. When we bought the little house in the south end of Carolina, first in Washington, we bought a house with a, a, a lot that extended to the Abbott, a, a, a lot to the side of it that didn't have any houses on it, in which we had a big garden. And we paid $1,625 for it. Well, I, it seemed to me that uh, anybody almost could have a roof over their head. We sold that for twice what we paid for it. And then we bought this little piece of land on the north edge of Washington and gave $1,725 for it. Everybody thought we had surely lost our minds. <laughs> there we had to spend. Well, we probably would never get it paid for. We built the house. And in 1940, I moved into that house. And I, <coughs> was, and I usually, my bark is always worse than my bite. But usually, uh, I go back on what I say. But this time, I had held my ground. I said that day, when I ever move again, it'll be a cold day. <laughs> All the cold days have come and gone 63 years now. And I still live in the same house. But I hear these people talking about 60, she says a while ago. Well, she's just a babe in arms, I'll tell you that. <laughs> because I'll be 95 here pretty soon. And I've seen a lot of things happen here in Washington. And I can't begin to tell you all of them, but some of the most interesting one of the stories were told to me by the older members who lived here, old timers who lived here. I was young in my 20s then. And they were anxious to tell their stories. Some of them had been back to their grandparents. Some of them were the stories that happened while uh, in, in their lifetime. And because I think we've taken up a lot of room, I'll turn it over to Malin. <laughs> Later I'll tell some of those stories. <laughs> Well, I was born in Washington back in 1928, lived here my total life. <laughs> lived out on, I was, uh, my father was a farmer, lived out on Booth Road, and uh, I was delivered by Dr. O.P. Bennett. We're trying to get some information regarding him as far as our uh, house over here on the little surgical building on the end. Uh, but he's the one that delivered me. I hope that doesn't uh, hurt any of that. <laughs> Putting him over here for that. But anyway, uh, my father was Malin, and uh, he had four or five brothers down here, so they made an awful lot of woman shine. <clears throat> there was, uh, he had no sisters, and uh, the name Malin is quite an unusual name. You never hear it around any place. But they, they say, why did you come up with a name like that? I said, well, it was my father's name. And uh, I'm a junior. Well, where did you come up with the, uh, where did he come up with the name? I said, look in the book of Ruth, first chapter, second and fifth verse. I said, you'll find it there. Hmm. And it is a Bible name, but it's the only place that you will find it is in the book of Ruth in the uh, first chapter, and second, and fifth verse. Uh, <clears throat> I have three sisters. Uh, we were a very fortunate family. Uh, all of my uh, my own three sisters are living, and uh, 
my oldest sister, and a lot of people don't know who any of my family is, because a lot of times they will say, they'll mention somebody, and I'll say, well, uh, Mildred Wynn, and Mildred and Joe, well, yeah, are they related to you? I said, that's my oldest sister. She's 89 years old, Joe's 89 years old, and uh, <clears throat> they live in Washington all their life. My next sister is uh, Margaret, Margaret Peffinger, and uh, Margaret's 83. I say, well, it's, you know, I didn't know that was your sister. Well, the one that they always know is my sister, and that's because she talks an awful lot, I think, <laughs> is Marie, <laughs> Marie Marsh. Uh, Marie knows everybody, and everybody seems to know Marie. She's 76, and she's the oldest one of the three girls. And I'm the youngest of the family and the only boy. But uh, Marie's husband is still living, Gabby. He's uh, uh, 78 years old. Uh, that was his mother's maiden name. Uh, Edgar is right. real name is Edgar Gabby Marsh. Uh, he took his mother's his middle uh, name. This is mother's, what's his mother's maiden name? Uh, then I have to keep the Blumenshine name alive as if there's any chance of it dying out. <laughs> because I look out over here and I look right over here and I see a cousin I look back there and I see Helen. Uh, Vic's wife is my cousin and I look over here and I see Geraldine, another cousin. And there are probably a lot of other cousins out here. Go way to the back, the Girl Scouts back there. I see my granddaughter back there. <laughs> scouting thing tonight. But my oldest boy is 40 years old, Wes is, and he lives in town here and is with Caterpillar. Uh, my next son is uh, Brad. He's 36. He got married here in October, his first marriage. Kept my fingers crossed for a long while on him. <laughs> and uh, he got uh, married down in uh, Champaign. And uh, good wedding, wasn't it, Sam? Yep. Um, uh, Brad has just got back. He called me this afternoon and toward evening, and he just got back from a cruise. And uh, he was in Florida, so. I took Carolyn over to my wife over to the airport this morning and she flew down to uh, Florida to meet up with them and she's going to spend uh, a week with them down there and then they're coming back. They drove down and went on the crew. But uh, the Blake, uh, his wife is Liz and they have two children. One is going to be a year old here this next month and the other one is uh, three years old. Uh, Brad's in the home improvement business down in Champaign. He bought a business down there uh, eight years ago, I guess it's been, and it's been uh, a very good business, successful down there. Uh, Blake, my youngest one, he works at Caterpillar. So two of them work at Caterpillar. <clears throat> when I started working, one of the questions was here about uh, what did you do? Most people are out here, especially if they have any age on them, know that I was at A&P right here in Washington. I started there back in uh, 42 was when I was uh, in high school. <laughs> And Bill down there, he got paid very well. At, uh, what was it, 83 cents an hour? I got a quarter an hour. <laughs> and that was going up and firing up the furnace in the morning before I went to high school. And uh, so when he said that, I thought, boy, he, got, he was really doing well. I would like to have one of those jobs. <laughs> I uh, delivered papers. I mowed yards. I worked for uh, AMP. Uh, and uh, at age 15, until I was uh, drafted in 1950, I missed the Second World War by six months. The 
Korean War came along and uh, they didn't spend a whole lot of time and uh, I got noticed to go in. Uh, I was in the Finance Center down in St. Louis, uh, Army Finance Headquarters. I thought I had it made down there and I did have it while I was there. But I took some schooling while I was down there uh, in finance and uh, on government time. And I had a little over a year left in service to go. And I got a notice where uh, 24th Division was really getting shot up real bad over in Korea. And I thought, well, because <clears throat> I got notice then that I was uh, going over to Korea. <clears throat> that didn't excite me too much, but it frightened me quite a bit. Uh, but I went over there with uh, just 13 months to go in the service, and uh, I got over there and they started calling out these orders for if he was going to stay local or if you had to uh, go over to Korea. Well, I was fortunate. I stayed in Japan. I went with the 24th Division and I got into finance in the 21st Regiment. I got into finance while I was over there and spent all my time uh, in finance in uh, uh, Japan. I had good duties. Uh, I had a lot of good uh, friends. Uh, there was a lot of them from Washington over here. I don't know. Uh, a lot of them. I think of uh, Ray Holding. He was over in Korea. And uh, Billy Leckie, a friend of mine, he was over there. And uh, they was uh, they was in the Marines, uh, and they was having a bad time. My best friend that I went to school with and went to church with, and uh, all Bob Summer, Bob was over there. He was in uh, uh, Tokyo, and I was in Sendai, Japan. <coughs> we got together uh, often over there, and. Uh, that was a, a lot of good times. Alvin Montgomery, Eugene Schroen, just a lot of those that was over there at the same time uh, that uh, I was there. The, uh, I went to work then. I came back from the service, and I went to work at the Central Bank of Peoria. Uh, that was in 1953. And, uh, well, I was over there. They didn't have Saturday hours at the bank over in Peoria. So I worked up here at the Danforth Bank uh, on Saturdays because they needed somebody uh, there. And uh, uh, just, uh, I learned more working one day here on Saturday than I did at the bank over in uh, Central Bank uh, all week. And uh, of course, I had gone then on to uh, school and got a uh, degree in uh, finance, and uh, I got that all by correspondence while I was working. And uh, I then left the bank over there. I had an offer as a junior officer in the bank. I was a teller over at the bank, over at Central Bank in Peoria, for uh, two years. And then I got an offer to go to the Community Bank of East Peoria as a junior officer, and I went there. And I was there 20 years. And uh, then I left there in 1975. I had the opportunity to uh, come to the uh, Sunstar Bank now. It was a Sunnyland Bank. And uh, as president of the bank there in Sunnyland. And beautiful people in Sunnyland. <laughs> oh, <Mary Blood. laughs> uh, I was there 26 years at the bank out from the, it was the Sunstar Bank when I retired here a couple years ago. And, uh, but it, uh, it was, it was a great, uh, great bank to be associated with. And the Morton Community Bank bought us out uh, three years ago. Then I worked for about a year after that, and I had uh, a bad <clears throat> foot. I was laid up with, I had a diabetic foot, they called it charcoal. I don't think anybody heard of that because my doctor didn't even hear of it. But 
the bone broke down in my right foot, and uh, I had to be in the wheelchair for five months. And uh, that was back uh, two years ago, and uh, that's when I retired. Uh, good thing I didn't write this, I really couldn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we was, uh, this, I don't know what down, but I was just thinking about this. We was talking about age, and, and you, I noticed that a lot of people, and I'm not going to say women, <laughs> but a lot of times when they turn to be 50 and you ask them how old they are, well, I was 49 my last birthday. <laughs> but then when they get up to be in the 80s, like my sister is 89, say, how old are you, Mildred? Oh, I can't believe it, but I'm going to be 90 my next birthday. <laughs> she wants to boost a year ahead, and, I and when they was in their 50s or middle age, they want to go back a year. But uh, anyway, talking about uh, that, when I was when we lived on the farm, uh, had some kittens up in the hay mound, and uh, I was out there, and I always wanted to go up and see those. Kittens. Well, uh, Margaret, my uh, older sister, is 83 now. She was uh, about six, seven years older than I was, and uh, so she said, "Well, I'll go up at the hay mile and uh, get the kittens and uh, bring them down." Because I couldn't go up; I was two years old. So I was standing down below, and I was crying and screaming and yelling for her to bring to get those kittens down there. And I guess she got fed up with it after a while, so. She brings one of the little kittens over to the opening there and drops it. Mm. Oh. And I had my hands up and going like that, come right across the floor. <laughs> scratched right across my face. So those aren't wrinkles that you see, those are <laughs> from that time. Anyway, uh, some of the things that uh, I enjoy most and uh, was the band concert and I know you went into that and I think uh, we all did uh, when they had it on the square here and I also think as far as the fall festival uh, that was always a good time on the square and uh, I noticed that uh, Stephanie and Joyce on some of the things we wrote down here is uh, where was a good place to take a date in town well, that's an easy question. The hard one was, how did you get a date? <laughs> Where to take them would be no uh, problem, but I couldn't get one. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, I wasn't much of an athlete when I was in school, but uh, I did go out for football as a, when I was a freshman. And, uh, Red Ellis, a lot of you probably know Red Ellis, uh, just as mean as they come. <laughs> and when we would scrimmage, I had to scrimmage across from Red, and I lasted on the football field. I was a freshman and he was a sophomore. I lasted out there uh, on uh, playing football for about two practices, maybe, maybe I made three. But uh, I thought too here not too long ago a good friend. Bob Shawhan passed away here just a couple weeks ago from up here in Matamora. And uh, Bob went to the high school here. George, or Red, or Bob, he had three names he went by. And uh, he played football here at the high school. And uh, just in the paper here a couple weeks ago, I saw where he had passed away. He was in his uh, later 70s. But uh, <coughs> Farrell, uh, Lytle, Mrs. Lytle's uh, son, uh, he played football. He was in my class, same age as I am. And uh, so, uh, and then uh, Craig, she has a son, Craig, he was a year behind me in, uh, in high school. And uh, he lives out east somewhere, doesn't he? Where does Craig live? Washington State. State of Washington. Yeah. 
but uh, Farrell, I think, lived in Peoria. And, uh, played football. Uh, <coughs> another thing I remember real well, I was at the age here when this happened, that uh, automobiles was really something great. I didn't have one, I'd like to. Ed Essig had the Chrysler dealership here in Washington. And at the Fall Festival, I think it was, and I don't know if I have all my information right here or not, but they was going to give a car away, and you had to take uh, chances on it. And Alvin probably remembers maybe uh, Ray's Tagri, Ray Thomas. Ray Thomas, yeah, I remember. Well, he won that automobile, didn't he? I think so. Yeah. It was a Chrysler. It had wood panels on it, and oh, it was a beautiful car. That's one of the memories that sticks that I can remember because it was, uh, I had my mind set on winning that car. And, uh, Ray had a uh, hybrid place right over here, uh, somewhere where the uh, uh, restaurant has it here in town. Forgot where it was at. Uh, I think that's about all I had uh, written down here. Oh, another thing that uh, I enjoyed very much, and uh, back in 1992, I nominated uh, uh, Edna Feet for the Washingtonian Award, and she did win the award as the Washingtonian of the Year. So it was my pleasure, and with my wife, that we got to take Edna over to uh, Peoria. Uh, I forget where it was that they had the uh, uh, Washington Day Banquet there. <coughs> Maybe at the Packard building. Uh, but anyway, uh, Royce Elliott was uh, the entertainer over there. Uh, Royce Elliott, I think most people know uh, for uh, better or for worse, I guess, uh, <laughs> as far as Royce is concerned. But, uh, we had a beautiful night that night over there. Edna, she just had so much fun there that night and uh, a lot of laughs. And one one-liner, which I'll always remember that Royce had, and he's got to have a straight man, he says, I had to shoot my dog. I said, oh, is that right, Royce? Was he mad? He said, well, he wasn't real happy about it. <laughs> I guess that's all. One question that I had was, um, if, if you went to school here at all, for grade school or high school, who was your favorite teacher or coach and why? Yeah. That's pretty easy, Mr. Holford, because he's here. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Mr. Tallman's here also. I had Mr. Tallman, so I better mention Mr. Tallman also. I uh, had a lot of great teachers at Washington High School who were very fortunate. Uh, and I believe today we also have great teachers. Uh, one of the biggest thrills I had growing up in eighth grade, uh, in 60, 1968, our homeroom teacher became ill and had to have some surgery. And back then, you know, you're off for six to eight weeks uh, for any kind of medical attention. And uh, Goldie Babco came in to be the uh, teacher. And I mean, it's like a legend walking into the room. And the boys in the class thought we could start football players. So. Nobody misbehaved, and, and we're from Sunnyland. <laughs> uh, it was just—it was just a thrill to have him stand in front of us. I mean, uh, just the stature and, and the way he held himself and things was quite an honor. I think my favorite teacher in grade school was uh, Mr. Staley because he was the shop class, and that was one of the easiest classes in grade school. <laughs> when I got to high school, uh, again, Golden Babcock because I was on the football team all four years, and algebra and geometry were real rough for me. And if you took that under Goldie, you automatically passed it. <laughs> <laughs> I never went to high school here. Uh, I went to this part of the country, I was out of school. But I'm gonna speak for my daughter. She graduated from out of Liberty Community in 1958 as valedictorian class, Nancy, Rose, maybe you remember. Nancy Rose. 
And uh, she started teaching. She had two daughters now. She lives in Delaware. And uh, she gave up teaching about two, about a year ago. Well, as I said before, uh, Miss Mary was one of my favorite teachers. But uh, Lois Brown, Edith Kinsinger, uh, Paul Crafton in high school, they were all great teachers. Well, mine were probably the two birds. Mrs. Swallow and Mrs. Rand. <laughs> and they used to get really mad when we called them the birds. <laughs> I was in book school here when my two sons started school, and of course their answer would be Miss Mary. Uh, Craig was in her last year, 19. 36. And uh, that, that was the last year Miss Mary taught. Goldie Matha, I wasn't too smart and pretty easy to get you through. <laughs> and Pop Clayton. Uh, I was kind of uh, surprised there when uh, Bill mentioned the staling there, you know, that uh, the woodworking, that's what Pop Clayton was, the shop teacher. And uh, I enjoyed that type of uh, work. And uh, Goldie, was, uh, he was just a, a great guy uh, all the way around. I mean, I, I enjoyed him as a teacher. And uh, I was uh, moved off the farm, came into town. I was a seventh grader, and Helen Thomas uh, was the uh, teacher up here in uh, the grade school. And uh, I enjoyed uh, her very much. Edith Kinsinger was a grade school teacher up there. They were good. Uh, Good teacher. I liked all of them. Well, yeah. But Goldie the best. <laughs> if my daughter was very nice, she would say, well, I've been sparring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see. Uh, I have another question. Uh, this one you guys didn't get to preview before. Uh, if you had to name a newspaper headline for your teenage years, how would it have read? <laughs> it could be something that was local for Washington, like an event, or it could be something that was happening in our world. <laughs> I mean, uh, look at the 60s and 70s, and you want me to make a headline again? Yeah. Uh, I need to be careful. Uh, I guess surviving the 60s and 70s, uh, I survived, they would be a good title. Uh, and stayed away from uh, the things that some of our kids are faced with today. So I think uh, surviving the uh, 60s and 70s uh, has, has been important to me. Hopefully my children uh, follow my footsteps. I don't know whether I'd tell a story or not, but I'm going to. <laughs> uh, in the Tazewell Reporter, there used to be a editorial jottings by Jim. And the gang guys that I ran around with in high school, we made that column pretty regular. <laughs> and uh, one particular time we'd set up in the square and decide what we were going to do that evening and it was mischief but not serious. Uh, one night we were uptown sitting there, a bunch of us, and we decided that we'd go down to Pekin and there was a big sign down there that was shaped like a beer bottle. And we thought that it looked good up on the water tower, up on the square. <laughs> So we went down to Pekin and took this sign down and brought it to Washington and put it up on the water tower. And Jim Nutty and I climbed that water tower and tied that on there with a the rope so it wouldn't blow off. Well, my dad uh, would set up to south side after work and have a beverage and talk to the old boys. And, and he came home and he was telling me for about two weeks how funny that was that Carl Manchin climbed up there and put that sign on there. <laughs> And Carl Minch was claiming that. And after about two weeks, I got tired of that. And I said, Dad, I said, let me tell you something. Carl Minch didn't have anything to do with that. And I told him about Jim Nutty and I climbing up on the water tower and putting that sign up there. And he said, what's the matter with you? Don't you know you could have got killed? I'm not sure that I understand your question. My hearing isn't too good. 
Something about a story? A headline for a newspaper during your teenage years. How would it have read? <laughs> Can I read something here? Absolutely. This has probably been recycled a dozen times. Way back in the uh, CC camps, when the boys went to CC camps, so the boy's mother wrote and said, Dear son, your Paul has a new job. The first one he's had in 48 years. <laughs> we're all a little better off now. The fact is, we're making so much money, we don't know what to do with it all. Paul gets $17.50 every Thursday. We decided we would do something great, so they were fixing up, so we went to the Montgomery Ward, or one of their little bathrooms you hear people having in their homes. It took the plumber to get fixed up in shape, but on one side of the room is a big, something like a, like a big trough. Once you get in, wash all over, and uh, dry off. Then on the other side of the room, a little white thing called a sink. Here's where you wash your face. But just listen to this one. Just over in yonder corner, where you've got something that's a thing you put one foot in, wash it. Then <laughs> you pull the handle, you push water, one foot in, wash it. <laughs> Two legs came with that thing. One of them don't have a use for them, so it takes one and use it for a breadboard. <laughs> the other one's got a hole in it, so we put Grandpa's picture in it. <laughs> it's coming on the wall. You know, Montgomery Ward is an awful good people to trade with. They even sent a roll of white writing paper without <laughs> it. I don't write much, so I just used to wrap Paul's lunch in. Quite soon, you're more. <laughs> I guess I'd have to say that uh, the Pearl Harbor attack headlines were the most important as far as I was concerned. Uh, I knew it was going to change my life and probably everyone's life for that matter. Uh, at the time I was working for Kroger's, or clerking there after school on Saturdays, and sugar rationing was going to begin. And everybody was supposed to declare how much sugar they had and were allowed, I think, five pounds or ten pounds, something like that. But the Saturday night before the rationing went into effect, I think we sold something like 50 or 60 hundred pound sacks of sugar. And I carry a good share of those out to different causes. <laughs> Believe me, there was a lot of sugar stuck in the attic around town that nobody ever mentioned. <laughs> well, my headline would probably read, uh, Young Teenage Girls, uh, or immoral because they watched Elvis the Pelvis. <laughs> he was on Ed Sullivan's and I remember my mother telling me I could not watch it on the TV set because he shook himself and gyrated and that was improper. So I simply went to my friend's house and watched it. <laughs> I don't think she ever caught me. <laughs> well, I go back a long way. I remember when the armistice was signed with Germany. And that was a big event where I grew up. I was attending a country school, 10 years old, and we saw down the road a hearse coming. And my, uh, the teacher said, I want you children to come up by the schoolhouse. This is a funeral, those people are silent, and I don't want you to make noise to come up and stand at the schoolhouse. It wasn't long until we could see that that was no funeral. On top of the nurse, the hearse was an effigy of the Kaiser. Mm -hmm. And after that, with the Model T boards and all kinds of car the cars that they had at that time, this was 1918, of course, bells were ringing and whistles were blowing and everything was going on and the armistice was signed mm -hmm. with Germany. probably the best one, but I couldn't think that fast. Uh, the opening of the new Washington uh, High School, I think uh, because that it was completed in 1942, and uh, I was a freshman in the high school at that time, and I was the first class to complete all four years in the new building. Uh, of course, 
most of you that are around here that know uh, anything about the high school, it was a very small part from what it is today. It was just that front entrance where you went in and the classroom down the side. And the girls' gym was a gymnasium, the other gymnasium has been built on since and so forth. But I think it would have been something along those lines I would have had in the paper. Uh, one more uh, question of the group, and that is, uh, what's the biggest change, pro or con, that you've seen in Washington? I'm not going to say Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from that as much as I can. Uh, I think uh, growth. I think uh, if you read the, the news uh, letter we just sent out in the newspaper the last few weeks, uh, residents, everybody wants to live in Washington. I uh, can't blame them. Uh, we actually had record numbers of getting this year, two years in a row. Uh, more and more people fall in love with this community, and I know why. Uh, all of you do too. Uh, more than more than last year, uh, new home construction. Uh, it's just a special place to raise a family. And uh, I think that's probably the biggest change, the growth that, that uh, the rest of this panel has seen uh, has to be just remarkable. But uh, there's a reason for it, it's because of all of you. Well, I'm going to agree with Gary on that because I can remember, and that's not that long ago, where when you got outside of Washington, it was quite a ways before you got to Beverly Manor. And then when you got outside of Beverly Manor, it was quite a ways before you got into Sunnyland. And going down into East Peoria, there wasn't anything until you got down to about where the Four Corners is right now. So growth in this community has been tremendous over the last few years. Uh, during my lifetime, that's one thing that I remember is the growth of the place. There have been so many changes since I've been here that I hardly know where to start. <laughs> but you tell the old brick pavement out on North Main. <laughs> and uh, I remember one time a guy coming from the north and uh, hit the brick pavement. Hit the, the other road wasn't slick. We had that brick pavement here so slick. He stayed in right to curbing right before, before uh, uh, Summers used to live. And the uh, door flew open, he flew out, and he fell out the road and killed himself. <laughs> and uh, I remember, uh, anyway, when he put that new road in, how much more it safer was than that old brick pavement. Well, I think I have to agree that the the streets in town were one of the big factors in the growth here. Uh, early on, they were all either just oil dirt or brick. And the brick streets in the springtime, the underlayment would become soft. You'd have big sinkholes and you'd go down the, the road bouncing up and down. Even the undercarriage of your car would scrape. But those are all gone now, or most of all of them. We still have Washington Street, West Holland, Catherine, and they could stand some improvement, but uh, we hope we can keep them uh, to kind of keep the uh, idea of Washington as being a uh, historical town. Well, I think the unique thing about Washington is it hasn't changed a lot like a lot of communities have. Yes, we've grown, but it's still Washington, a small community, uh, a friendly community. So I really, from my viewpoint, don't think it's changed that much other than the growth. But we're still a great little community. The thing that impresses me is when I first came here, the show places in town were at the Danforth houses. And then we decided that maybe we wouldn't have the Danforth houses very long because the older people were gone and they would be turned into office buildings or something of the sort. And I've lived long enough to see them all retained and all refurbished and all almost like they were in the first place. The, uh, uh, the one piece of Danforth house is almost like it has always been. Then where Hallmakers is, it's been refurbished. Mrs. Timpson's house 
has been bought and it's been redone. And uh, now the Rubmans have kept the beautiful house that they have. And it's been wonderful because that was one of the drawing cards of Washington. I really don't have any <coughs> great changes that uh, I think about, but I am thankful that we didn't take out the <coughs> Washington Square and uh, run the highway right through. And I am uh, thankful that we was able to uh, save our square. I think that's uh, a great part of our community. Thank you. I would just like to say thank you again for, for having all of us here, but uh, the South leaders, I'm not sure who they were, but uh, I think if any of you see them or know them, to, to ask, to let them know how special it is to have those young girls stay. Uh, those kids are our future, and the more and more we can tell them about our past history, and I wish, I know there's an eighth grade group that's doing it now, uh, studying the history of Washington, but it is so important that we do not lose the stories that we've heard tonight, the stories that all of you have. Uh, it's important that our kids hear those. So uh, I would encourage you to do this once a quarter uh, with, with the group. It's uh, fantastic. Slogans, always on the square. March. Who had that march? Sorry. Okay. Anywhere in Washington for 25 cents. 
Buddy Boy Cab. Right. <laughs> Buddy Boy Cab. Always stop to salute the American flag. Now, we had that at our meeting there, Billy, you probably know that one, too. That was uh, Boy Scouts, wasn't it? Yeah, but uh, yeah, some guy in Washington here. Oh, the shoemaker. Did he, did he want to? Heine Yeah. Yeah. Heine Ganser. Always said, give me a nickel. Johnny Leonard. <laughs> okay, thank you. You guys pass. <laughs> In 1944, I lived on the country, had a little acreage there. I caught some young pigs. I didn't have any money to run out of feed for those pigs. So I went into the bank. Mr. Paul Boosie was in the bank, Frank Berkey, Ron Dingledine, and another. Berkey. And I asked Mr. Boosie if I could borrow $100. Come back to my office. So he went back and he gave me a 20 minute lecture about borrowing money and the war time and so forth and so on and had me feeling bad almost. <laughs> anyway, I thought, oh, Mr. Boosie, I've got those hogs to feed. Are you going to loan me the money or not? Well, he says, yeah, I'll loan you the money. When do you want to pay it back? I said, I'll pay you back in three months. Well, in six weeks, I sold the hogs and went to the bank the next day and paid him back. <laughs> about that time, the Eiffel Bank State bank came in, and so I started banking over the state bank because Mr. Boosie gave me such a fatherly lecture, I didn't know whether he wanted to borrow him. <laughs> I got another little story about Goldie Babcock, and you guys talk about him being a legend. Uh, I can remember distinctly, I think, that I was a sophomore, and we were having football practice, and Oki Baxter was a junior, and Oki could run like the wind. He played halfback. And Oki was kind of dogging it that night. He'd probably been out late the night before or something. And Goldie was probably, I'm guessing, 55 or 60 at the time. And he said, what's the matter, Oki? And Oki said, well, I'm tired. He said, I can beat you for 50 yards. Oki. Then Goldie said this to Oki. And they took off running. And Goldie beat him for 50 yards. He was 55 or 60 years old. And I'll never forget that because it amazed all of us. <laughs> I was talking about Oki Baxter. Uh, brings up this little story here that I was uptown here one night with uh, Paul Stuckey and I. We went down to uh, Bowling Alley and bowled a game. And some of the other guys was there. And we got all done bowling, and uh, Paul went back to put his bowling shoes on, and there was no bowling shoes there. And uh, so he wore his, uh, uh, wore his street shoes went there, so he wore his bowling shoes home. Came back a couple of days later, and he was uptown, and we were standing out in front of Tully's like we did with lack of anything better to do, watching people walk by. Pretty soon, here comes Oki walking down the street. Paul Stuckey looks down and he says to me, he said, you know, that looks like my shoes that Oki's got on. <laughs> and I said, really? And he said, yeah. Oki, come here. He said, I want to see you. Where'd you get the shoes? Over Sears. How much did you pay for them? Nine dollars. Paul says, you know, he says, those look an awful lot like my shoes. He said, you sure that you bought them? He says, gee whiz, are those your shoes? He says, Stuck. He says, I thought they were going Comanches. Herald has brought back many fond memories of my 30s, 40s, and 50s, 
I was four years ahead of you in high school, so you were in the eighth grade when I was a senior. And 1945 football games were played on Sullivan's cow pasture. pasture. How many of you remember that? Okay. My date for the home, for 1945 homecoming was Dolores Attic, a sophomore who was crowned the homecoming queen. Dr. Monroe was a doctor that Goldie Babcock sent the football team uh, players to for their physicals before they, we could play football. Ms. Whittaker was a great a band director. She taught me how to play the sousaphone, which I played for three years, riding the school, whoops, which I played for three years in the Washington uh, Community High School band. Many of us people from Sunnyland didn't mind riding the bus to the brand new WCHS from Sunnyland uh, on the west side of town. All five of us blank boys enjoyed the many years we played in football and basketball for WCHS. So much of my memories, I have enjoyed the publications of the Historical Society. God bless you as you go into your retired years. Anybody know who that might be? I'm sure you will when I get it to tell you. John Cherry. <laughs> so uh, it, it, just, just a little hint of uh, you know, maybe maybe we should have stayed. George Rose uh, plays the guitar and sings, and so we'd like for you to close out the evening, if you would, with a little tune. You were going to sing lightly. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, I heard good things about you, George. So I, 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 I need to see what you can do. Well, yeah, while he's setting up, I can do this. Uh, we, uh, I think we pronounced this before, but now we have the goods to prove it. We are now part of the National Register. This uh, certificate is going to be put in bronze uh, and put uh, on the side of the house. Uh, this took a long time, to, a lot of work to get to this but uh, we are now on the National Register. Our Zinsser House shows up in many publications. So we're grateful for all of you who hung in until we got it done. Thank you. Joey's calling me out here with those signs back. I don't know if I tell him to play a little for you. Say, if you could bring your ukulele. <laughs> Well, 70 years ago, I had ukulele. It's going in the full side now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, put this one up. If you play something we know, you, we know we'll just sing along with you. What? If you play something we know, we'll just sing along with you. I might do that. <laughs> Back in the, the four radio days, uh, I had an old banjo. Mom bought me a guitar, finally. I started picking that old guitar about 19, 25, 26. I haven't improved much since. <laughs> but anyway, one of the songs we used to sing on a tender radio, the old Carter family sing, Keep on the Sunny Side. <laughs>
He called himself Pipe Plant Pete with his two shoulder cup. What? Pipe Plant Pete with his two shoulder cup. Pipe Plant Pete, you know, I go to the bird and do it too. <laughs> well, I may be a doohick you like this. I'll move on number nine wire. I'm through with a little bit. Let me get the car. Anyway, I started beating on that day, so I like mom. It's like the old mom crazy. And, but I stayed with it. And finally got to the point I play a little too. Here's one we used to play. Oh, now wait a minute, what more say? Now, <laughs> listen to the Super Bowl game after you've heard it happen. That's what I'm saying. But it's not my thing to sing like that, so you're gonna have to put up before I put up. Get an old old car. Foggy mouth. Thank you for coming, and again, enjoy our work.